Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Hamry. I'm the president here at CSIS. And um, I, I feel so privileged for the opportunity that we are going to have this afternoon. Um, I admitted to President Ali that I am a typical American. I don't know anything about Guyana, okay? And that's one of the problems for Americans. They don't know anything about Guyana. And we're going to have a rich opportunity today to learn about a very exciting story a remarkable story about what's the most positive thing I've heard in just uh, so long. Um, so I'm going to be in the audience and listening, but I do want to say welcome to all of you, and I do want to say thank you to one of my bosses, John Hess, who is the, on the board. John knows Guyana, and uh, when I heard that President Ali was coming, I said, John, would you please come down and represent CSIS, because you know Guyana and I'm a student. So would you please welcome John Hess, please. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be here, and thank you again, John. I'm delighted to be here with you at CSIS, and I especially want to recognize John uh, for his leadership of such an outstanding institution that continues to represent the best thinking on critical issues to our country and to the world. So for that, John, thank you. <laughs> Most of all, I'm honored uh, for the opportunity to welcome and introduce my friend and my dear friend, His Excellency, the President of Guyana, uh, Mohammed Irfan Ali, on behalf of CISIS, we're proud to welcome you uh, to our nation's capital for your first official state visit. So thank you for that. I would also like to recognize uh, uh, the other distinguished uh, members of your cabinet and other government officials who are here today. Uh, and as John mentioned, uh, we really look forward to being educated and informed and hearing more about your exciting plans for the beautiful country of Guyana. Mr. President, it's an important time uh, for you to be here. Guyana is a leader in uh, the CARICOM community, uh, touching the Caribbean, touching South America, uh, being a member of that community, and uh, your country is playing and your leadership is playing a key uh, role uh, with growing influence in the Western Hemisphere. Under your leadership, the relationship between Guyana and the United States continues to strengthen, and your visit to Washington serves as another building block in that relationship. And we're also honored and happy today uh, that Ambassador Lynch is with us as well. Mr. President, you're a leader with strategic vision, and you're also a leader who is willing to do the hard work. I've seen it firsthand. You're traveling across Guyana and putting in long hours. You are passionate about creating conditions in Guyana and getting results that will positively impact the lives of every Guyanese citizen. You are truly committed to serving the people of Guyana. Hess Corporation is honored uh, to be your partner and to be investing in Guyana and to have the opportunity to play a key role in helping build Guyana's oil and gas industry. Development of this country's natural resources is important to our company, important to Guyana, and important to meet the world's growing energy needs. Guyana has made tremendous progress since our first offshore oil discovery on the Staybrook block in 2015. It is a remarkable achievement that the country is already producing more than 300,000 barrels of oil per day of some of the highest value, lowest carbon crude oil in the world with a line of sight to be producing over 1 million barrels per day by 2027. At that time, Guyana will become one of the largest crude oil producers in the world. This achievement is a testament to your leadership and the support of the government of Guyana and our joint venture partners. ExxonMobil, as operator, has done an outstanding job with project management and project execution, not just for the joint venture, but more importantly for the country of Guyana, especially operating uh, during the challenging times of COVID. A key point is that the president has made it a top priority to develop the country's oil resources to the highest environmental standards. Guyana is positioned to be a global leader in the strategic and transformative development of its natural resources to build long-term shared prosperity for the people of Guyana, safely and responsibly. For example, 
The government and our joint venture partners have recently signed an agreement and are working closely together to advance a gas to energy project that will enable Guyana to shift from imported fuel oil, currently used for the majority of its power generation, to natural gas supplied from the Staybrook block that is lower cost, cleaner, and more reliable energy. Guyana is blessed with so many natural resources, the greatest of which are the country's human resources. The President is committed to providing every citizen with access to affordable and high quality health care, to providing every child with a strong education, and to making infrastructure investments that will unlock the country's full potential. On my first visit to Guyana years ago, I pledged on behalf of Hess Corporation to work with the government to ensure that this country's oil treasure truly becomes the people's treasure. Earlier this month, we announced a strategic partnership with the government of Guyana and Mount Sinai Health System, one of the most respected and finest healthcare institutions in the world. Bringing Mount Sinai to Guyana was a priority for the president, and he would not rest until our agreement was finalized, which was several weeks ago. It is that determination that promises to bring to fruition this government's vision for a brighter, healthier, and more prosperous future for every Guyanese citizen and the country's future generations. Mr. President, welcome to CSIS, welcome to our nation's capital, and welcome to the United States. We're deeply honored to have you here with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Distinguished members of the audience, Ambassador Sarah and Lynch, and every single meeting and stakeholder I met with so far had only outstanding words to speak about the ambassador, including the center. I'm very pleased to be in this building because over the years I've read a number of reports and articles and uh, ideas coming out of this building. It is no doubt that this building and those who work in this building would have contributed significantly to policy making, policy coordination, and to delivering positive results, not just for the US, but for our global environment. But I'm here today to confine my remarks to Guyana, <clears throat> and I will do so in a very compact time. There are a number of challenges facing the world today, and I want to position Guyana in all those challenges so you will have an understanding as to what this country Guyana has to offer the world. Let's start with the issue of climate change. Every conversation on development and policy making today cannot be complete without addressing the issue of climate change. I present to you a country today in which 87% is covered by forests. Forests the size of England. Forest that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon. Forest that holds a value of more than 500 billion United States dollars. So I present to you a country that is enormously rich in biodiversity, ecological services, environmental services. But who is paying for these services? How are we monetizing these services? Let's have a frank conversation about climate change. We can't say we understand the value of these important services to the world, and we don't understand the value, the monetary value, that it takes to keep these services intact. Because we are also a country in which the greater percentage of our population live on a coastal plain that is below sea level. 
one flood event can cost 60% of GDP. We already experienced that. You have to find the resources for adaptation and mitigation. Climate change is not an accident or an event, and it cannot be dealt with in a transactional way. It has to be, de to be dealt with in a global policy formation that brings the commitment of everyone. It cannot be dealt with in a piecemeal way. The ending of fossil fuel will not end the climate change crisis. There need to be a balanced conversation, a conversation that understands the reality of the world, because guess what? When supply becomes low and demand continues to increase, price is affected, and the most affected continue to be the developing world. So this conversation cannot take place without the balance. And I want to present Guyana as a perfect example of a country and a policy-making environment that is seeking to achieve that balance in our development trajectory and our commitment on climate change. We are a net zero country. We have the lowest deforestation rate in the world, among the lowest in the world, 0.05%. We have a forest that goes through all the rigid global audits. And we're not going to change that. Before oil and gas, our development was structured on a low carbon development trajectory that looked at the enhancement of, and prosperity of people, the improvement of livelihood, the development of our infrastructure and our human resources, the transformation of our country as an important part of the environmental modeling. As we move forward with our oil and gas sector, we are simultaneously moving forward and advancing our forests as a tool to combat climate change. And we are now moving the low carbon development strategy to a low carbon development strategy 2030 that expands itself beyond the forests to the ocean and the blue economy. So our commitment to climate change and development, uh, sustainable development is unshakable, unshakable. So that's the forest crisis and the position of Guyana in the forest crisis. The second crisis has to do with food security. The world today is faced with what some describe as a coming catastrophe. Not only the prices of food, but the supply. You may have the money to pay for the food, but the supply is just not there. Important inputs like fertilizer is too costly for the small farmers to afford, unless the governments are going to put serious money into subsidizing it. The supply chain crisis, the war in Ukraine, all of this is adding to the multi-dimensional nature of the problem of food security. As if that was not enough, the lack of resilience in the food security environment is also a factor to be taken into consideration. That is why we cannot have a conversation about food security, global food security, without a conversation on research and development for food security, Te access to technology, deployment of technology, and cost of technology. Very important. Who's putting the money into these areas that would en ensure long-term food sustainability and food security for the region? Now again, I present to you Guyana. Guyana is one of the country that has rich freshwater resources. We have abundant fresh water, large-scale arable lands. We are well positioned to be the food basket of CARICOM, the Caribbean. For a matter of fact, in the early days of the development of CARICOM, Guyana was referred to as the food basket of CARICOM. And we're working aggressively on a plan 
to reduce our import requirement as part of the whole CARICOM plan of 25 by 2025. That is reducing our food import bill by 25% by 2025. So in food security, we have the potential to become a leader also. Climate change, food security. Transport and logistics. Global transport and logistics since the supply chain crisis has exposed tremendous shortcomings in the whole network. Northern Brazil is landlocked from the Atlantic, and the easiest fix to that, to get direct access to the Atlantic, is the development of a deep water port facility in Guyana that can be linked to a free zone facility, allowing Guyana to become what Panama is in terms of transport and logistics. This is the long-term multi-dimensional vision that Guyana brings to the table. Our natural gas also gives us the opportunity to, de to be deployed in a way that can see Guyana and Suriname combining their efforts to be the energy capital of the Guyana Shield and northern Brazil by the development of an energy corridor. That is also great potential. So in transport and logistics and uh, the whole system, the ecosystem to support that with a free port facility, Guyana is again a leader in terms of potential opportunity. Then we come to science and technology and health and education. We're strategically positioned culturally and uh, politically to the Caribbean, but we are also on the mainland of South America. We are very close to North America. We can become an important health and educational hub for the region. And we are working on a plan to see Guyana unlock its potential in becoming a health and educational hub. We are working on developing a new plan and looking at ways in which we can encourage multinationals to use Guyana as their home for their headquarters to see how we can unlock opportunity in ICT and technology, robotics, engineering, how Guyana can become an important launching pad for uh, vaccine manufacturing. While our market is small, through trade agreements, we have access to more than 400 million people. And these are preferential trade agreements. This is the type of future we are talking about building out. To do this requires revenue, resources, building up the, the, the infrastructure, the opening up of new lands, and, that, and this is where the revenue from oil and gas becomes important. The revenue from oil and gas must be used in a sustainable way. It must not be spent. There's a difference in spending money and using money to catalyze opportunity. And this is how we want the revenues to be spent. Transforming lives. Giving the best quality education, the best quality healthcare system, ensuring prosperity for all, ensuring equality, reducing disparity, bringing prosperity to the, re to the region, supporting infrastructure transformation, but more importantly, building out the sectors of the future to be competitive. Building out the sectors of the future to be the driving force for development, not oil and gas to be the driving force for development. These sectors, the emerging sectors, the new economy, must be built on a platform that drives the future, drive the jobs of the future. And our human resources must be reprogrammed and retrained to benefit and support that. So for example, we are already discussing how our primary school children, all of them, must have elementary access to coding before leaving primary school. How our high school children 
must have advanced training in software development before leaving secondary school. This is what is going to create the high paying, high, high definition job, if you want to put it in that context. So yes, we have 11 billion barrels of oil in our reserve and still counting. But that must not be what Guyana is known for. We have tremendous other opportunities that must be unlocked. The cost of energy has always been in inhibitive to our development. We are now working on reducing the cost of energy by 50%. That allows us now to compete in agro-processing, manufacturing, industrial development. And not industrial development and manufacturing of the past. We're talking about niche markets, new products, new innovation. Uh, you know, we are very happy to have a construction expo in Guyana now and the 3D printer that do homes. I think we have three globally. One is in Guyana. We're working on a program to have every single young professional, every single family owning their own home because unless we improve the net asset value of families, we'll not be able to escape inequalities in society. Net asset value does not mean everybody will be equal in value, but it means that the asset value of each family must be upgraded to give them a decent livelihood. So this is the part of our development. I don't want to take up all the time here, uh, but I want to say in a nutshell, this is the approach to what we want to consider resilient and sustainable development. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. President. That was inspiring. You have an inspiring vision for your country. I'm very anxious to visit Georgetown and visit Guyana. Um, it's, it sounds like an amazing opportunity, and I think the United States needs to have a, a deeper, more strategic relationship with your amazing country, and thank you for your amazing leadership of Guyana, and we're so happy to have you here at CSIS today. And you talked about a number of different other industries and other opportunities beyond oil and gas, because I do think um, for some reason you're getting a lot more attention than, you, than Guyana did say you know, 10 or 15 years ago, and I think we all know why. You talked about health and education, you talked about investing in people, you talked about agriculture, you talked about climate, you talked about transport as a hub. You're very blessed by your location, you're, it's, and you also, um, you're Anglophone, and so I think that's also, I think, a plus in many ways in, this, in the world that we're in. Your government is very well aware that there's an enormous opportunity with, with the oil and gas bonanza that's coming. You will be the Guyana of the Caribbean, but you might also, you'll, be, uh, you'll produce as much oil and, and gas as Kuwait or the United Arab Emirates someday. But you're going to be your own country. Every country, though, that's had this blessing has also had to manage the danger of this. It's called, you know, it's called the resource curse. Your, your government has been thinking about this for a long time. You've had some, you have, you've put a lot of thought into this. How are you going to manage this, re, this potential resource curse challenge that Guyana is going to be presented with? This is a question that, uh, that comes up all the time. Uh, resource curse and managing resource curse. And it's a legitimate question. Very legitimate question. But you have resources, it's a curse, and if you don't have resources, it's a curse too. <laughs> it's true. It's a jeopardy. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a jeopardy. And in both situations, you have to manage. Because if you don't have resources, you still have to manage for the best outcome of people. And if you have resources, you still have to manage sustainable, in a sustainable way to have the best outcome for people. So what is the common factor? The common factor is management. And who is it that determines whether you have good management? People. So that's the fundamental thing. You have to ensure you have the right human resource, the right people, the right attitude, the right culture. Unless you fix that and get that right formulation, then nothing else <clears throat> would work. 
I went, you know, I go to many uh, forums and they said, oh, you're from Guyana, the new rich kid on the block in oil and gas. I said, no, no, I'm from Guyana, the humble country that is poor and looking for concessional financing. Mm. You see, resource costs start from changing who you are. And when you change who you are, you start spending what you don't even have. Mm. You start rocking up debt in an unsustainable way. And you start counting on projection of revenue you haven't seen as yet. That is the curse. That is the curse. So it is building institutional capacity. It is building systems. It is building a structure of management and governance that ensure you avoid those pitfalls. That is the first thing. And that is how this process is evolving. So we have a natural resource fund that is independent, independent from government arm. We have in the law a penalty of 10 years imprisonment for the non-disclosure of information. That is revenue coming into the fund. We have an independent investment committee that incorporates the central bank on the investment of the fund. Then we have the legislative oversight because the only way the fund can be used to finance anything in the country is if it passes through the budgetary process. To pass through the budgetary process, it has to pass through the parliamentary process, subject to debate, subject to parliamentary approval, and subject to public scrutiny. So the system is being built in such a way to ensure people participation. Because sometimes the economists and the mathematical modelers in our society develop formulas that people can't understand. But we have developed a formula that anyone can calculate. $10 comes in, $3 go to uh, savings for the future, $7 go to the budget. You don't need to get a special calculator to do the calculation. Because systems must, must, must not be developed for academia and the intellectual class. System must be developed for the people, for the understanding and involvement of the people. That is critical. Not complex, complicated system that you know, only a few of us can understand the outcome of. So the resource card starts from that. It also is about resource allocation. You know, we have had many approaches. Oh, we can build you guys a whole new uh, uh, office complex for the presidency. You can have a, a beautiful uh, a new government complex. Oh, don't worry about the money. We'll build it all. We'll build it for you, and then you'll rent it from us. Really? Really? We don't want that. We are very comfortable in the office that has supported us, uh, supported the, the, and housed the office of the president since independence and, and before. Nothing is wrong with, with that building. The country has to be transformed. Our infrastructure has to be transformed and modernized but not done in a way that is fanciful. When you have a lot of resources, you get excited. You want to build 10 highways when the country only needs three highways. So it's striking the balance, understanding the balance, defining the priorities, and financing the priorities as a matter of preference. That's fantastic. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, Guyana and Venezuela have what Guyana calls a controversy. Uh, around the border between Guyana and Venezuela. I know, and you know, Mr. President, that the border was settled in 1899. And thankfully, the United States supports Guyana's position that the border between Guyana and Venezuela was settled in 1899. For some reason, Venezuela decided to, I don't know how to describe it, reopen this or dispute this. But, but thankfully, the United States supports Guyana in this. What, how, what should our listeners know about this controversy? 
that is just a controversy. And Guyana knows exactly where our borders are. And CARICOM and all uh, right thinking actors support Guyana and, and understand the boundaries of our country. Including the United States. Including the United States, of course. Uh, let me say that um, we believe in the rule of law. And we have approached the ICJ. The ICJ is looking at this matter. And we are encouraging Venezuela to participate fully in the ICJ and to respect the outcome of the ICJ. And that is how we are dealing with this matter. We are very confident about our position. And we urge uh, all actors to respect the rule of law and allow the ICJ to complete and participate in the process. Excellent. Thank you. You know, here in Washington, we've, um, we are, have a different, we've, we've been thinking differently about mainland China in a different way. And so we often look at the whole world now through how do people think about their relationship with mainland China. You have relationships with many countries, uh, just as we do. Uh, there's one of the firms investing in, in the energy sector is a, is a Chinese firm. How, how does Guyana think about its relationship with mainland China? Our relationship is uh, based on the country's uh, ability to move its development path forward. It's based on uh, ensuring respect for fundamental principles, ensuring that we support common values. And China has been in the region, uh, CARICOM, Latin America, for a very long time. They have supported the development path of many countries. They have supported the development path of Guyana. They have invested in different projects over the years, as has the United States. Uh, and we have been encouraging the U.S. to become more aggressive and to take a, a, a more strategic space, a place in this space in the region. But the truth is, we cannot look at the relationship of China in countries in the region without looking at our own position. And I'm speaking from a country perspective. And one of the important uh, discussion at the Summit of the Americas was the priority that the region occupies in the foreign policy and mindset of the US. And there is a great view in the region, and this was before the Summit of the Americas, that there has been some amount of neglect for the CARICOM region by the US. And that was officially raised. After the Summit of the Americas, I can say there has been an enormous move to rectify this. We had CARICOM leaders had a meeting with the president and vice president. In that meeting, three subcommittees were established to focus specifically on the priorities of the region, co-chaired by the US and CARICOM. And the results are already uh, becoming- Starting to see some you, movement. Yeah, yeah they're, become, they're coming to, to, to fore. And timelines were set. So I think that the U.S. acknowledges, and they have done this, they have done this uh, with the leaders, acknowledge that there was some resetting that was required, and I'm very confident sitting here that that process of reset has started. The, the level of uh, seriousness and priority that the region is given mm -hmm. has been reignited, and we are hoping that this can continue in an aggressive manner. And that is why people like uh, Ambassador Sarah are so important in the process. Totally. Because they are the ones who have to drive this process. And we are seeing that. I mean, look at this, this week here. We have been able to accomplish very strategic things, uh, some things that are historic. Uh, today we signed uh, an MOU with the XM Bank. And if you look, sometimes we look at things narrowly. If you look at financing, from the EU and financing from the US, you actually can compete and outcompete. 
but the information is not there. The access, the access and spending time presenting the opportunity is what is required. And that is the platform that is unfolding. So I just want to do a housekeeping, have a housekeeping moment. So we'd love to capture a couple of questions from the audience. We're going to, you have to write them down on a note card. And my friend Henry's going to read them. So if you have questions, I think we're going to want, just raise your hand and, and Henry will capture those. And so as we're having the conversation, he'll capture them and he'll read the questions, OK? But I just, so just as, an, as an FYI. OK, Mr. President, thank you for going to Los Angeles. Thank you for going um, to, the, um, to the Americas Summit. Uh, we, it, there was, it was a little bit of a close run thing. There were some countries in CARICOM that weren't going to go. You could have not gone. It was really important that you went, Mr. President, and thank you so much for going. It was very important that, that you were there. And um, I think it was very important to have your voice there and the message that you brought. And I think that um, I know that President Biden, President Biden visited as vice president Central America eight times as vice president, and he visited the rest of the region another eight times. So this is a president of the United States who cares about the region, though, you know, unfortunately, we have a little bit of ADD, and we're easily distracted, and there's always another crisis. It's always been that way throughout our history. We're constantly, we underappreciate, we especially overlook the Caribbean, especially overlook the Caribbean. We did a report, I don't know, about 18 months ago about rethinking our, our approach to the Caribbean. So I think your, your voice and your perspective is really welcome right now. Uh, and I'm really proud as an American that we've sent one of our best ambassadors in Ambassador Lynch. I'm very, really pleased that, that, you, you, that we, we sent her. And she's so well regarded here in Washington. And it's a symbol of the seriousness of our intent to have a stronger relationship with Guyana. You know, at the same time, I think about the issues you were talking about, health and education, uh, agriculture and climate and transport. And one of my worries is, is that on paper, you're going to become very quickly, maybe not today, but in five years' time, and what to call, you know, you know all the terms, upper middle income, high income. And so the, the, the bureaucrats are going to say, and I'm a former bureaucrat, so I, I, I you know, it, they're going to say, well, you're a wealthy, on paper, you're a wealthy country. And, and Mr. President, you've made it very clear that you're a humble country with a vision and you, you know where you, you come from and you've got a vision of where you're going. And you also have a very um, careful approach to how you're going to husband those important resources, both for the present and for the future. How, how could the United States be a better partner to you in all these things that you've talked about? I mean, I would love to see USAID set up an aid mission in, in um, Guyana, I'm sure the ambassador is too, but she can't necessarily say that. <laughs> I'd like to see the World Bank do more. I'm sure the World Bank looks at you and says, oh, you're kind of a higher income country. And so the most engagement you get is probably from the Inter-American Development Bank. They've been, they're the most reliable organization for this work. I mean, in an ideal world, we would set up a USAID mission. And then as the money came online, we would have some sort of shift in how the money is, you, some, maybe you'd pay more and we'd pay less. And you know, just Oman does that, for example, with the World Bank. Could you imagine some sort of a different kind of a cooperation model that instead of the, the usual, we have sort of a typical playbook we have for foreign aid, but you know, you're, you're not a typical country. So how, how, sh how would you like, I mean, could you imagine something like that where we engaged with you in that way? Well, uh, I have news for you. Uh, maybe that is because, uh, is serious here. That conversation has started. Great minds think alike. And, this and I week, did not speak to the ambassador. <laughs> and this week has all been about that conversation. Okay. Redefining Good. the relationship, looking at the strategic outlook of Guyana and aligning that with the, the various actors here in the US. So that process has started. We are, uh, we are trying to harmonize what we do. And that is why we had that MOU with the Exim Bank. We are working also, not only from a government to government and agency to agency perspective, we are looking to see how we can catalyze the private sector into this. 
get the private sector more interested so that they can build uh, and, 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 and be part of the opportunity. But importantly also, how we link and build the relationship within the two private sectors. So we have transfer of knowledge, technology, the sharing of resources and so on. And uh, IDB Invest, for example, is playing a much more active role uh, in the market uh, these days. We have, if, if you look maybe a year from now at the, the, the financing portfolio of Guyana, it will be very impressive because you will see the European Union, the UK, the US, China. You will see a very multifaceted approach in terms of the diversification uh, uh, and the diverse nature of the financing that will be supporting the development. Great, good. Okay, let me, you've talked about more attention from the United States and, and you, a relationship with the United States is multidimensional. It could include development, investment, and trade. You're an enormous economic opportunity and I think some of our best ambassadors are American companies like, like the Hess Corporation and really, um, really proud of our American companies that are investing in, in, in your country. But also when we have a relationship, sometimes there's other dimensions to the relationship and that includes a security dimension. So you are, you have the, the blessing and the ability to pick your friends, but sometimes you can't necessarily pick the neighborhood you're in. Um, I think about other countries that have had a bonanza of wealth. I think about a Kuwait, Qatar, UAE, Bahrain. And I think that um, they've rethought their security relationship with us. So if I said to you, could you imagine a different kind of a security partnership with the United States? If I think about things like illegal fishing, illegal mining, narcotics, there's a variety of security challenges, cyber, uh, climate. Could you imagine a different kind of security partnership with the United States? It's not the imagination, it's the reality. Uh, these challenges are with us already. And a big part of this visit is dedicated to security coordination and collaboration. The U.S. is uh, playing a greater and more integral role in our security architecture. We are building partnership. We have an information sharing platform. We have greater collaboration and cooperation. We have integration in what we are doing. And then we are doing some other things that I will not discuss okay. uh, at this point. But there, uh, there is that reality. And we are working with the U.S. on confronting that reality as an important strategic partner in, in building this alliance uh, that will deal with the multi-dimensional nature of uh, the security challenge. Because with the sophisticated uh, investors comes the sophisticated criminals too. Building the architecture, building the infrastructure, supporting the infrastructure, training and development, all of this is in that new equation. Information sharing, technology sharing, working on common platform, support with, uh, through technology, all of that now is in this comprehensive security plan that we're developing uh, and, and working with the U.S. on. And that has been an important part of the agenda and, and the discussions we have had uh, up here. Um, uh, John, uh, uh, Mr. Hess, indeed, um, is a good example of a U.S. company that values social responsibility. Mm. He mentioned the partnership with Mount Sinai, what he did not say is the very proactive role uh, uh, financially that Hess Corporation uh, is playing in the build out of the healthcare uh, sector and supporting the initiative in, uh, Mount Sinai, with Mount Sinai. Okay, great. But just on this issue of security, let me, so you, it, it's, what you described is it's, you have an ambitious vision for deepening your relationship with the United States across a number of different dimensions, including security, and you are open to all sorts of potential possibilities about deepening your relationship with the United States and from, a, from a security standpoint. Definitely. We not, not only uh, deepening our relationship, but it is, uh, for us, it is an imperative that the U.S. plays an important part in our security architecture. Uh, our geographic location uh, brings with it its own challenges. 
And when we talk about building out an infrastructure that would have deeper, faster, uh, more integrated connection uh, with more countries, uh, you, you know, you attract new challenges too. So definitely that's an important pillar. Okay, so this is to be continued. Definitely. Okay, maybe I'll leave it at that, but I, I think you know where I'm going with that. Okay, okay, so Mr. President. I'm walking with you, but I'm not. Right, to. we gotta walk before we run. <laughs> okay, I get it. Mr. Mr. President, we're a multiracial society, the United States, and we're not a perfect country and we have a lot of challenges. And I think perhaps maybe we could learn a little bit from Guyana. You're a multiracial society. What, what can you share with us, to this audience and to the United States, about your multiracial society and, and the progress you've made? Because uh, we, we've made a lot of progress. We still have some progress to make. Could you share a little bit about that? Because I think it's important when people understand Guyana, that it's, you're a diverse country and you're, you're doing, you've done a lot to, to be more inclusive as a society, and maybe we could learn from you. Yeah, we are a very uh, multi-ethnic society. It's one of our assets. We look at this not as a, uh, we look at this from an asset perspective. It is one of our, our greatest gifts, the uh, multi-ethnic makeup of our country. Now, we also have an uh, indigenous community, the Amerindians. And if you see our record on what we have done to mainstream their development into the national development priority, the laws we have passed, the, the work in giving them access to land, improving their uh, access to social services, uh, it's enormous because you cannot achieve the type of unity unless you work on social issues, on economic issues, political issues. And there is a thin line. You know, if you look at our housing program, you will see all Guyanese benefiting. You look at our public service, you will see the reflection there of, uh, of how people are benefiting. Um, but then you can have uh, political pressures that seek to use uh, diversity for selfish political gains. And like any other country, you have that challenge where political actors would use this rich asset for selfish political mm. gains. And that is the problem. That is what we have to stamp out. The only way we can stamp that out in societies is if we are willing to call it out. We have to be willing to call it out, and everyone must call it out. You can't be someone who believes in freedom and equality, and you're in the world of academia, and you sit uh, behind a classroom or hide in a classroom when you're confronted with these challenges and you're not willing to call it out. Mm. This must be something that all of us work together on. Building public trust, respect for each other, these are things we have been working on. These are things that over the years has evolved, supporting each other. And if you look at the country as a whole, there is one time that you see ethnic insecurity uh, popping up in a, in a real sense, and that is in elections. And that tells you what is the problem. The problem is that people see this diversity as a tool that can be deployed to improve their electoral prospect. Absolute nonsense. Has no place in a modern society in which we are building a platform for the advancement of all humanity. That is why a lot of my time is spent on building the concept of one Guyana. What constitutes the one Guyana? What are the value systems? What are the principles? How would development be done in a way to ensure that Guyana blossoms together? So, Thank you for that. That's very inspiring. I think messages of respect and having a one country, we, we work at that too. We, it's a work in progress here. Thank you for that, Mr. President. I know we have a couple of, of questions, so Henry, please go ahead and, and why don't we pick two or three? I know we, we only have so, a little bit of time, so go ahead. Yep, our first question comes from William with the Osgood Center for International Studies, who asks, President, 
how do you plan to continue working with the United States from a climate perspective, as well as address and complete the most economically beneficial deals with the private sector that wants to work in Guyana? Well, uh, first of all, we have to have a full understanding uh, as to what our joint priorities are. We have started that conversation on climate. We have given our commitment on what we will do in relation to climate and uh, climate change and environment. So uh, it is an important part of our development uh, trajectory. The private sector from the United States, this, uh, sometimes the, there is a narrow view of markets. Um, they look at the scale of projects in a country and then determine uh, that's too small for us. But there is a medium-sized enterprise that might see viability in the scale and size of those projects. Uh, it is educating also, it is getting the information out. And that is why these sessions are important. Uh, you know, a lot of Americans don't even know that Guyana exists uh, or the type of opportunity that exists in Guyana. So these sessions allow us to present Guyana, present the opportunities. It allows the US government to also send the right signals and that is what the U.S. government has done with the signing of the MOU with the Exim Bank. But listen, we know Guyana is there. We know there is potential. We know there is opportunity for the mm -hmm. private sector. Here is it, the U.S. government is backing that knowledge with resources. So come to us. Let's talk about how we're going to uh, uh, build your future and take, uh, make use of the opportunities in Guyana with the support of the government. Great. Go ahead, Henry. Our next question comes from Matthew with CSIS who asks, we understand that today your delegation met with Vice President Kamala Harris. Um, how did that meeting contribute to what you've just discussed with, with strengthening Guyana-US relations? Well, it contributed significantly. The first thing that we need to do to advance any relationship is to have conversation, to understand each other, to share our uh, perspective on things. Maybe different, but unless we share it, we cannot understand the commonality, mm. understand where each other is coming from. And this conversation with the Vice President and President started at the Summit of the Americas. It, uh, it has advanced rapidly. So I would say that our conversation today was refreshing. It was, uh, it was beneficial both to Guyana and, uh, and the US and CARICOM. It confronted the the big issues, it was very frank and open, very respectful, and uh, it outlines the, the vision and, and supports the vision that I've been talking about. I think we have time for one more question. Is that okay, Mr. President? You go right ahead. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Our final question comes from Maureen, who asks, what are Guyana's plans to enlist the diaspora in the nation's development mm. future? Uh -huh. Very good. So I said at uh, another forum that, uh, the bond between Guyana and the U.S. is not political, economic, or social alone. It is people and cultural. Our largest diaspora reside in the U.S. Our largest diaspora wow. reside in the U.S. In New York, we have an entire avenue or street uh, named Little Guyana. So we are connected by people. The greatest connection you can have. The diaspora is an important part of the development story. The type of development that will occur in Guyana requires people. We have to expand. The population has to grow. And the first direct uh, category uh, of persons who can grow that population is the diaspora. We're migrating, coming back, contributing to the development. But we have members of the diaspora who would have contributed significantly to the development of the U.S. in the area of science and technology, business development. And a lot of them now are looking at the opportunities home. But I want to say that those opportunities come with a cost. You have to be able and ready to make the investment in research and development. It is just like investing in any other country. You have to do your homework. You have to do your risk analysis. You have to do your feasibility study. Sometimes people look at this as, at a cost. This is not a cost. This is an investment that is essential in, a, in, in addressing whatever you want to do. 
So the diaspora is an important uh, and, and, and very uh, strategic asset that we have that must be and will be incorporated in the transformation phase of our country. Mr. President, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking the President of Guyana for being with us today. It's thank fantastic. you. Thank you, Very Mr. Nice. President. Great. Good. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank it's you. an honor to have you here. I hope, I hope we can do this again. Yes, thank absolutely. You.